Hello and welcome to Sparda Lines, your one-stop destination for the civil services preparation, UPSC, KPSC and other relevant examination. Today we have picked up a couple of important articles from the Hindu which are very significant from your UPSC and your KPSC examination point of view. Let's get started and look into the first article. But before that, a quick gentle reminder. As we all know, we have been conducting a test series for all those of you who have been taking the CTI, PDO and the KS examination. The fourth test will be conducted on 17th of December from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. and this is completely free conducted on both on the offline as well as on the online pattern. For those of you who want to understand how this entire examination is conducted, what are the type of questions that can be anticipated in the near future, please do pay heed to this test series and you should be taking this test series compulsorily. Let's get started and look into the first article. The first article says, Governor threatens financial emergency in Kerala as row with CM breaches new law. What is this article speaking about? The article here is speaking about financial emergency. What is this article speaking about? The article here is speaking about the grave concerns that have been voiced by the governor of Kerala with respect to the financial impropriety. This means that we have the government of Kerala according to the governor. He says that the government of Kerala is not able to pay enough amount of salaries to the KSRTC that is the people who run the bus institutions bus organization the ksrtc which happens to be the road transport corporation the government of kerala is not able to pay enough salaries for them why that is because of the financial impropriety and at the same time the government of kerala is also not able to keep up to the commitments of the financial finances so this means that the government of kerala is not able to maintain and sustain its financial commitments and as a result, the, gov the governor says that in all likelihood, he may, he may recommend for the financial emergency. It is in this particular backdrop, we have to understand what is this financial emergency all about. When we speak about financial emergency, where is it mentioned? It is mentioned in Article 360 of the Indian Constitution. What does it speak about? It speaks about provisions as to financial emergency. If the president is satisfied that the situation has arisen whereby the financial stability or credit of India of any part of the territory thereof is threatened, he may by a proclamation make a declaration to that effect. What do we understand by this? Let's say for example, a situation has been created where the finances of the country or the finances of a part of a territory, which means it can be a state, it can be a specific region. So if a specific part of the country is not having a financial proprietary, there is financial fiscal imbalance that is created in that part of the state or throughout the entire country. What can the president do? The president can immediately issue a proclamation saying that we would be imposing a financial emergency. If I have to give you an example, are, are there any instances where financial emergency has been declared in India? The answer to this is no. Still date, we have not imposed financial emergency in the country. That is because it may send a bad signal to the entire global economy as well as to the people within the country. So as of now, till date, no financial emergency has been declared. That's the first point. The second point that we have to cater to is that in case the financial emergency is imposed, what could be the likely implications? The only time where we were close to imposing a financial emergency was back in the year 1991. So back in the year 1991, India did go through some grave economic crisis. During this particular period, what we also was, India transformed itself to a completely mixed economic mode or in fact it also embraced parts of capitalism as well. Until 1990, what we had was aspects of socialism. The state had the major control when it comes to the economy. Everything was being regulated by the state and by the government. The government provided what is called as the license permit raj. 
But after 1991, India opened up its economy. Why did India open its economy? That is because of the grave crisis. We had the Kuwait war that was being undertaken in Kuwait. India was not able to import the fuel and the oil from Kuwait. And as a result, India had to spend excessively for procuring the fuel. Let's say it procured the fuel from Malaysia. And at that particular moment of time, India did not have enough energy reserves. India did not have enough foreign reserves as well. So India, in order to import the energy, that is the fuel, it had to shell out a lot of money. And as a result, what happened? India's foreign reserve came to a brink. India's foreign reserve almost got out as well. At this particular period of time, India could have imposed financial emergency, but it did not impose financial emergency. So till date, not once has India imposed financial emergency. That is the first important pointer from the preliminary examination point of view. So what happens when a financial emergency is imposed? A proclamation will be issued by the President of India and this may be revoked or varied by the subsequent proclamation. So what do we mean by it? Let's say for example, we issue a proclamation saying that financial emergency will be imposed for so and so period. Immediately after that, it is the President who would be able to cancel it, revoke it and ultimately withdraw it. How? By issuing a subsequent proclamation. So he would issue a statement or proclamation saying that India has come under financial trouble. So so what we will have is the uh, financial emergency being imposed. So an order will be passed. So a proclamation will be issued. A statement will be made by the President of India. Subsequently, to cancel this, another proclamation will be made by the President of India. And this shall be laid before each house of the parliament and the proclamation issued shall cease to operate at the expiration of two months. So what is the period it will be in execution? If there is no proclamation that is issued time after time, it will be in practice, it will be in implementation only for two months unless before the expiration of that period, it has been approved by resolution of both houses of the parliament, which means the president issues a proclamation, it will be in practice for the period of two years. If it has to continue, then it has to be authenticated and it has to be given permission by both houses of the parliament provided that if any such proclamation is issued at a time when both the houses of the house has been dissolved or the dissolution of the house of the people takes place during the period of two months referred to in sub clause 2 if a resolution approving proclamation has been passed by the council of states but no resolution with respect to such proclamation has been passed by the house of the people before expiration of that period the proclamation shall cease to operate at the expiration of 30 days from the date on which the house of people first sits after its constitution. What do we mean by it? Let's say for example, if there are no two houses or let's say for example, if we only have Rajya Sabha, within two months they have to issue the proclamation and they have to allow for its continuation. But what if we do not have the Lok Sabha in place? In that particular moment, we have the Rajya Sabha. The Rajya Sabha may have accepted it, but we do not have the Lok Sabha right now. So the minute we have the elections and then the Lok Sabha is formed, from the date of the first sitting of the Lok Sabha after the election, within the next 30 days, they have to accept it. If they do not accept within the 30 days after the start of the new Lok Sabha's proceedings, in that case, again, this proclamation will immediately fall flat. Unless before the expiration of the set period of 30 days, a resolution approving proclamation has also been passed by the House of the People. Both these will have to be considered for the revocation or for the cancellation of the financial emergency. During the period of any such proclamation in operation, the executive authority of the union shall extend to giving directions to any state to observe such canons of financial propriety as may be specified in the directions and to the giving of such directions as the president may deem necessary and adequate for the purpose. What do we mean by it? It means whenever a proclamation has been issued by the president, the union government will also be able to tell the state governments that dear state governments, India is going through a financial emergency. At this moment, don't spend too much. Don't spend uh, money on schemes and programs where it will take a lot of money. Don't spend 
spend money unnecessarily and don't have uh, imposed and make sure that whenever you are imposing a certain program or an implementational program do not give a lot of freebies and the subsidies so financial proprietary has to be followed says this part of the section notwithstanding anything in this constitution any such direction may also include a provision to reduce the salaries and allowances of any class of persons serving in connection with the affairs of a state for example the government is giving salary to the employees of the state the government is also providing salaries to the people working for the government of india or the government of respective states their salary can also be reduced as well a provision requiring all money bills and other bills to which provisions of article 207 apply to be reserved for the consideration of the president after they are passed by the legislature of the state in fact whenever the state decides that they have to pass a money bill or if the state decides that they have to execute a money bill this will also require the permission of the president itself it shall be competent for the president during the period any proclamation issued under this article is in operation to issue direction for the reduction of salaries and allowance of all or any class of persons serving in connection with the affairs of the union including the judges of the supreme court and the high court so during this period they can also reduce the salaries of the judges of the supreme court as well as the high court so this is what financial emergency is all about now let's look into the next article this article says an anti-terror law and its interference with the liberty what is this article speaking about the article here is speaking about UAPA. What is UAPA? This happens to be one of the major laws in the country which basically deals with Unlawful Activities Prevention Act which is to do with the terrorist related activities. In order to curb the menace of terrorist related activities, what we have is the UAPA law. What is this UAPA law? Let's say for example, a person is planning to execute a terrorist activity or a person has already executed a terrorist activity. How do we prevent it? How do we ensure that this person does not commit to this terrorist activity? What are the ways and means we can stop a person from committing a terrorist activity? Is what is encrypted and is present in the UAPA. So UAPA basically stands for Unlawful Activities Prevention Act of 1967. What this article focuses is in specific reference to the bail provisions that are present in the UAPA and it also says that whenever a person is subjected to this law, this person's liberty is stripped off, his article 21 gets violated. Why? Prima facie, the minute the state or the executive believes that this person has involved himself in a terrorist activity despite he not have committed any act getting bail under this uapa law is very difficult but in a new decision made by the high court of jammu and kashmir that is jammu and kashmir's high court they have given hope where the state cannot constantly interfere with the liberty says this article what is the author trying to convey let's look into what the author says the author in this particular case takes into picture section 13, section 18 and section 43D of 5 of the UAPA. What does it section 13 say? It says someone whosoever takes part in or commits, advocates, abates, advises or incites the commission of any unlawful activity shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to 7 years. Whoever in any way assists any unlawful activity of any association declared unlawful under section 3 after notification by which he has been declared so has been ineffective shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to 5 years or with fine. Nothing in this section shall apply to any TT agreement or convention entered into between the government of India and government of any other country or to any negotiation. Similarly, when you look at our section 18 of the UAPA, whoever conspires or attempts to commit or advocates, abates, advises or insights directly or knowingly facilitates the commission of a terrorist act or any act preparatory to the commission of a terrorist act shall be punishable with an imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than five years but which may extend to imprisonment for life and shall also be liable to fine as well what does this indicate this basically indicates that when you look at section 13 and section 18 
what we have is some of the vague provisions according to the author. So, the author says that if there is a slight apprehension that a person might have committed anything, the executive would be able to arrest such a person and getting bail for this person is also a difficult task. The author takes into picture 43D of 5, notwithstanding anything contained in this code, no person accused of an of offence punishable under chapter 6, 4 and 6 of this act, if in the custody be released on bail or on his own bond, unless the public prosecutor has been given an opportunity, one part, provided that such accused person shall not be released on bail on his own bond, if the court on a perusal of the case diary or the report made under section 173 of the code is of the opinion that there are reasonable grounds for believing that the accusation against such person is prima facie true. So, on the prima facie, at the first level, at the first instance, the, mo the moment I see that there is a grave crime that is committed by this person, bail should be denied to this person whosoever has committed under UAPA. In fact, this also has provisions of preventive detention as well. What is this preventive detention? We have two types of punishment. One is what is called as punitive detention. The other one is what is called as preventive detention. So, under detention, punitive detention basically means that a person has committed an illegal act. Court has proved it. Then this person is ultimately thrown behind bars. Why? Because the trial has been conducted. This person may have committed this crime and it is proved in the court of law, which is why punitive detention. Then there is preventive detention. What is preventive detention? Under this, a person might have not committed any crime but there is an apprehension that this person will commit a crime so under this law it basically means preventive detention can also be taken up which means he is not committed a crime it is yet to be proved but there is an apprehension that this person may commit a crime to prevent it to enlarge the scope of it preventive detention is also present so prima facie when you look at section 13 section 18 and section 43 d of 5 it ultimately stands that a person may be arrested despite he not having committed the crime and if prima facie there is immediate proof it is not proved yet but prima facie on the look of it on the face of it when taking cognizance of that particular issue if it there is a slight viewpoint that the person may have committed a crime this person can still be thrown behind bars as well. So, the author in this particular case says that UAPA when it comes to few sections are very vague, very ambiguous, there is a lot of grey area. So, in order to rectify this, what we have is a judgment given by the Jammu and Kashmir's court. So, the Jammu and Kashmir High Court has looked into this entire evidence and also arguments made by the councils and has ultimately said that this person can be released on bail primarily because there is no such evidence prima facie. So, Mr. Shah's counsel argued the charges under section 18 were illegally unsustainable as the state had not linked this act of publishing an article with terrorist act punished under the law. So, this person who was accused of the crime had published an article on the newspaper and after he had published an article, this ultimately led to a conclusion that this article could be a problematic one and can be booked under the UAPA to which the government sought to argue that the publication of an article was an act of terror as it sought to harm property in the form of India's reputation. So, because this article could harm the reputation of the country which is why UAPA was ultimately imposed and which is why he was thrown behind bars. So, the High Court ruled that to agree with the government could flip criminal law on its head by creating an altogether new offence alleging the of defame, defaming the country as terrorism seemed to me like a bridge just too far to cross. So, this ultimately meant that whatever proposition that was taken by the government that whenever a person is imposed with such kind of penal provisions, it is like creating a new criminal offence. Ideally, this person should have been released on bail. However, he is yet not released on bail primarily because the government was subjecting him to prima facie feeling that this article could be the harm to a country's reputation. But the High Court said that if at all this particular provision and this interpretation is taken, this person's right to live with liberty will be ultimately exhausted. It will not come into picture. And then it said that this entire exercise executed by the government 
is not right said the high court and ultimately granted bail to this person ultimately the high court held both the law enforcement agency as well as the court must apply their mind before exercising their powers of arrest and sanctifying further detention to ensure that only in cases where a clear and present danger is evinced are persons taken into the custody so this basically meant that only when there is actual proof that is when this person can be arrested or detained behind bars or else bail can be given said the high court however there are some issues as well what are these issues where compensation provided to this individual no this person might have spent a lot of time behind the bus is he compensated for it no the government might have committed a crime the executive might have committed a crime this is not subjected to the verification as well as the, to the understanding of why the government did take up this initiative of arresting this person if these questions are not answered justice will not be delivered to that victim says this article yes the high court has or may have provided the bail but ultimately it should have taken a larger questions of compensation and questions of why an arrest was made by the state and answer all these questions is what is this article all about now let's look into the next article this article says patent exclusions madras high court shows the way what is this article speaking about the article here is speaking about patent what is patent a new innovation in the form of a new device or in the form of a new mechanism or a new innovation something which is novel in thought has been created by one of the uh, organizations companies so on and so forth so the minute this organization or a company is come up with an innovation which is novel in thought what they will do is apply for a patent a patent basically if given by the patent registry it means that company or an organization alone would be able to produce that particular product for a period of about 20 years in the for a period of about 20 years and there will be no competition whatsoever so complete monopoly about the production of this particular equipment or this particular product will be with that company and as a result any other company will not be able to produce it so what is patent patent is the exclusive right given to the company to produce a product which it has invented why because it has invested a lot of money into the generation of this particular product invested a lot of money on to the what is called as the uh, invention because it does not know whether this particular product will be fruitified or not so in order to give boost to the innovation so that more people can ultimately come up with newer products complete monopoly is given to this product and the company for about 20 years and subsequently after that that is when it will be opened up in the market and during this period they would have generated enough profit so that they can reinvest this money into the future products that is what patent is all about however patent will not be given to all types of products there are some exemptions as well this exemption is covered under the indian patent act of 1970 where it says for what invention for what kind of inventions patents will not be given for example an invention which is frivolous frivolous or which claims anything obviously contrary to well established laws so there are well established law let's say for example if you throw something on the top due to the force of the gravity everything will fall down so that is an established law so tomorrow you would come up and say that i would throw something on top it will stay in the air can it happen no this is against the natural laws anything that goes on top should have to fall down that is the rules of the gravity that is present it is an already persistent natural law as well so tomorrow if i throw up something and then something say someone says that it will be in the air for considerable period of time which is against the natural laws that are present is it not against the natural laws if a person claims such an invention that will not be given a patent an invention that primary or intended use of commercial exploitation of which could be contrary to public order or morality or which causes serious prejudice to human animal or plant life or health or the environment let's say the invention is against the laws of the country if there is a law that says that you're not supposed to or you're not permitted to invent so and so but despite the law present if a person goes about creating something which is against the laws and the public policy of the country in that case it will not be given the patent even if it is an invention they will not be provided an 
patent that is the second part the mere discovery of a scientific principle or the formulation of an abstract theory or discovery of any living thing or non living substance occurring in the nature let's say for example there is an organism you have discovered that organism you have not created that organism you have not invented something new so you have discovered will patent be given to it no and at the same time there is a scientific rational let's say for example there is a chemical reaction that is happening on the sun so it is a discovery so will it be given a let's say patent no this will not be given a patent so mere discovery of a scientific principle or an organism will not be given a patent the mere discovery of a new form of a known substance which does not result in enhancement of the known efficacy will not be given a patent for example let's say uh, you have to read d and e together let's say you have a medicine this medicine has already been invented this is for fever and what do you do you just change the chemical combination of this medicine and you once again say that i have to be given the patent you are already given the patent for about 20 years you did make a lot of profits as well so after 20 years you just create a chemical structural change and you say this has to be enhanced further patent has to be given will it be given no why because for the same product you just creating a structural change and you are asking for a patent in this particular case if patent is given this will lead to evergreening of the patent what is evergreening of the patent that ideally a patent will be given for about 20 years but if you keep on changing only the structural system of that particular chemical structure this means that it will not be released in the market after 20 years it will not be cheaper and ultimately this entire exercise of giving patent will also fall flat as well that you would be able to generate profits and ultimately it will be restored for the humanity but this will not happen if evergreening happens so if only an add mixture a chemical structure is changed in that case patent once again will not be given the mere arrangement or rearrangement of duplication of known devices known functioning independently of each other in a known way what do we mean by it? let's say for example you would have a pen drive slot in your laptop in your pen drive slot it is given on the left side now if you would say i will put it on the right hand side that is an innovation does it mean that it is an innovation no it is just the rearrangement of the tab rearrangement of the slot of the pen drive on your laptop such cases you would not be given but any patent let's say then you have any process of medical surgical curative uh, diagnostic therapeutic or other treatment of human beings or any process for a similar treatment of animals to render them free of disease or to increase their economic value that will not be given the patent any method of agriculture or horticulture this will not be given the patent plants and animals in whole or any part thereof other than microorganisms but including seeds variety species essential biological process for production this will not be given the patent a presentation of information let's say for example i have googled information about the patent i am discussing this with you i am giving out the information to you so i have research i have put in my hard work yes i am giving you the information as well can this information that i am delivering be given as patent not at all this is not a subject matter of patent it can be a subject matter of copyright but it is not a subject matter of patent so patent is novel and innovation which is something new which is distinguished which is not happened in the past but if information sharing it is not called as the patenting a literary dramatic music or artistic work is not part of your patent because that is once again part of what is called as the copyright a mathematical or business method or a computer program per se or algorithms a identification coming up with a new computer can be a patent but a program per se can be become a part of a copyright and it is not part of the patent so it is once again a, a bit of an elaborate discussion as to what will become part of copyright or what will become part of patent but on a prima facie level if there is something novel new innovation a computer in itself that can become a patent but a program can become a part of a copyright so these are the and topography of integrated circuits an invention which in effect is a traditional knowledge for example what is this traditional knowledge we have turmeric at home this turmeric can be applied to the wound this is a traditional knowledge or neem that we have can also be used used to the hair that is a traditional knowledge can this be given patented no this cannot be patented as well so the author in this case goes on to say that under section 3 of e we have some inventions 
which will not be given the patented rights. However, in new interpretation that has been made by the Madras High Court, the author also goes on to say that when it comes to section 3 of E and when it comes to section 3 of I, a new interpretation has been made by the Madras High Court where there can also be patented. So, what does the author say? In Novozymes versus Assistant Controller of Patents and Designs, relates to section 3 E, which includes from protection those compositions that amount to a mere aggregation of their components. We did discuss about it. The court holds that 3 E does not exclude from the scope of protection aggregates that are already known. This therefore means that if any ingredient independently satisfies the requirements for the grant of a patent, irrespective of its inclusion in a composition, it would be patent eligible. If the ingredient is able to act and is able to represent in an independent way. So, add mixture basically means that you add a chemical, you bring about a chemical structure that does not happen. But if it is able to stand independently, if it is able to operate independently, in that case, patent can be awarded. Similarly, in Hong Kong and Shanghai University was asking control of patent, which relates to section 3i. The judgment sheds considerable light on the kinds of diagnosis that are excluded by this filter. Specifically, it was held that the bar is not merely confined to an in vivo in vivo in vivo invasive diagnosis which involves conducting tests on the body equally the bar is not so broad to cover all processes so if it is able to access independently if it is able to decide the chance so or disease has occurred independently in that case patent can be given so if the process in question cannot uncover the pathology of the fetus it would not be a diagnostic test and hence not fit by the bar under section 3 of a so if it is able to diagnose a disease independently in that case patent can be given says the author so the author also takes into picture the one of the important paradigms called as the bright line rules what is this bright line rules so whenever when we speak about cases what happens? It is the judges who ultimately give a judgment in a case. So, there is a specific provision, there is unique circumstances, there is no objective criterion that is drawn. Everything is very subjective, there is interpretation that is made by the judge on the basis of which there are decisions that are made by the judges. So, what does the bright line rule say? The bright line rule say that we have to come up with an objective criterion to remove the subjectivity of the interpretation. So, in this case, whenever we speak about patents or let's say we have criminal laws in place, there is a lot of subjectivity that is involved. Each person will try to interpret a specific provision and ultimately will make a judgment. To remove this ambiguity, to remove this vagueness, to remove this grey area, an objective criterion has to be drawn to remove the subjectivity and that is what is called as the bright lines. So, in the light of the fact of the research and development, cost for the development of new pharmaceutical drugs and process are extremely high. There is need to prevent the grant of overhead monopolies in the name of public interest. Yes, however, bright line runes can help prevent much needed consistency. So, these bright light rules are nothing but removing the subjectivity so that we have an objective criteria. So, that interpretation cannot be done very vague, but it happens on a uniform way. And this uniform application of law will ultimately bring in some clarity about the interpretation of such and such clause in the Patents Act or in any other law for that matter. So, the author in this particular case, Madras High Court has been able to interpret in a very nuanced and in a very understanding manner and ultimately those people who come up with those products are ultimately innovating something new. They are also provided justice and this is not wrong says the author. So, subjecting a particular interpretation to too much vagueness should be removed and that is what bright line rules is all about. So, bright line rules is a technical term which means that an objective fixed right criterion is drawn removing the subjectivity when it comes to the interpretation. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. Now, let us look into the next article. This article says, understanding the debates about anarcho-capitalism. What is this anarcho-capitalism? This just happens to be a philosophy. You should be aware about it. Let's say if you have taken public administration or political science optional, you should have an idea about anarcho-capitalism. What is the concept of anarcho-capitalism? Let me simplify this in brief. 
For example, when you consider the state, what we have is a social contract theory. What is the social contract theory? This basically emphasizes on the fact that we are all living in a society. We have entered into a contract which basically means I am ready to give up on few rights because I am ready to enjoy the larger rights. What is the example? There is a traffic signal. What is the signal all about? To prevent the chaos on the road. If it is red, all of us will stand by. That is, we will stop and we will wait for the signal to go green. And only when it is green, we will make through our way. So this is the social contract. So similarly, we have also had a social contract which basically emphasizes on the fact that with respect to the criminal law, certain acts should not be permitted. Certain acts should not be done. If at all a person commits an illegal act, who will take custody of this person? It is the police officer. It is the police officers who will ensure that there is law and order in the society. And at the same time, what we also have is a picture that if the police officer arrests a person, it is only the court will have to ultimately conduct a trial and prove and ultimately come to a conclusion whether this person has committed a crime or not. So what we have is a state apparatus in the form of a police officers and in the form of a court. This is run by the state. What is anarcho-capitalism? Anarcho-capitalism basically says that we have market running the show. For example, if I have to procure this particular pen or the stylus, it is the market where I'll be able to procure. Does the state have any role in it? No, because it is the market forces which ultimately control everything in the market. Or let's say for example, if I have to buy this stapler, who will decide all this? It is ultimately decided by the market forces. For example, if I have to call your mobile manufacturers, telecommunication, yes, the state does regulate certain aspects, but everything, most of it is market oriented. Similarly, according to anarcho-capitalism, it says that state and also courts should not be part of the state. Instead, even that should be left to the market. For example, if there is an issue of, let's say, a law and order problem, there will be a private security agency. There will be private courts as well. It is the private security agency which will be able to ensure that there is system of justice that is delivered to the people. The state will not come into the picture. The courts will not come into the picture. And you will not have the police officers. But this ultimately means everything will be in the market situation. If I have a problem, I will be going to a security agency which has been authenticated, which also has the respect of law and ultimately they would be able to protect me. So when it comes to the normal process of police and the court, they are funded by the taxpayers money. So the taxpayers money will ultimately ensure that the salary is given to the police officers and to the court officers and to the judges and ultimately they would be able to provide justice. But when it comes to anarcho-capitalism, there will be no state police, there will be no coach. Instead, there will be private police and security agencies and the coach which will provide justice. This is just a vague concept but all I want you to do is that I want you to read through this concept. So in anarcho capitalism there will be no police officers representing the state there will be no court but instead what you will have is a private security agencies and the private court which will be able to safeguard your rights is what is this anarcho capitalism if you are a student of political science and public administration this concept is very very important now let's look into the next article this article says Modi kicks off global AI summit what are we speaking about? We are speaking about Global Partnership for Artificial Intelligence Summit. Let's understand some important facts. The Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence is a multi-stakeholder initiative which aims to bridge the gap between theory and practice on AI. So this will basically include many countries. This was launched back in the year 2020. At that particular moment, there were 15 members. Today, what we have is about 29 members who are part of this summit. So the point is about discussing what are the AI related topics, priorities, how it works, so on and so forth. Currently, GPAI has four working groups on the themes of responsible AI, data governance, future of work, innovation and commercialization. India is a founding member of GPAI, having joined the multi-stakeholder initiative on 
June 15, 2020. So India is a founding member of GPI. This can be a prospective question in your preliminary examination. What are the various aspects of GPAI? When we look into it, what we have is the research symposium. Then what we have is AI Game Changers Award, India AI Expo and what we also have is the Pitch Fest. When we speak about AI Expo, what we will have is the Ministry of Electronics and Communication organizing Global AI Expo. It will focus on organizations, educational institutions who are at the forefront of AI innovation. This exhibition will also have industry leaders, policy makers, thought leaders, domain experts, fellow innovators, so on and so forth. And at the same time, what we will also have is Game Changer Award who are able to create impact on the AI level. So if there is a problem, they come up with a solution on the artificial intelligence front. Such industries will be given the AI Game Changers Award. Then there is Research Symposium, which basically has number of people who will get into the research and ultimately come up with a product. And then there is Pitch Fest as well. This is conceptualized to harness the platform provided by annual GPI Summit onwards, promoting financial stability as well and finally what we will also have is the AI safety summit which will ultimately conclude that all these aspects fall in place as well. So this AI summit will basically include bridging the differences that are existing as of now in AI and also recalibrating the approach of artificial intelligence. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. So this is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.